everybody. Welcome um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for our event uh, with uh, Mother Jones presenting Tom Philpott uh, for his new book, Perilous Bounty, The Looming Collapse of American Farming and How We Can Prevent It. Uh, joining him in conversation is Mother Jones Senior Editor, Maddie Oatman. Uh, she, Maddie writes about the environment, food and farming and culture. Her writing has won awards and been featured in the Best American Science and Nature Writing. She's the executive producer and co-host, along with Tom Philpott and Kira Butler of Mother Jones Podcast Bite, a show for people who think hard about their food. Uh, in her most recent feature for the magazine, she wrote about a tech-fueled effort to help farmers get paid for the carbon they sequester in their fields. And Tom Philpott has been the food and agriculture correspondent for Mother Jones since 2011. Uh, previously, he covered food as a writer and editor for the environmental news website Grist. Philpott's work on food politics has appeared in the New York Times, Newsweek, and The Guardian, among other places. From 2004 to 2012, he farmed at Maverick Farms in Via Crucis, uh, North Carolina. Uh, he lives in North Carolina and uh, Austin, Texas. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, Tom and Maddie, welcome and thank you both so much for joining us. Tom, congratulations on the book. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, Evan. Um, Tom, I just want to congratulate you. I know it's it's been several years since you've been working on this and it's so cool to see it come together. So huge congrats. Thank you, Maddie. And thank you for all of the great editing and guidance that you've given me over the years. And I also want to say a special thanks to Evan and Booksmith for making this happen as well. Um, a few more things people have been saying about this book, just to kind of rev it up a little bit. Um, Michael Pollan on Twitter called it the most important book on the food system in years. Um, Bill McKibben called it a tour de force. And um, Barry Estabrook said, it's a must read for anyone who eats and hopes to continue doing so in our changing world. So if you, if you don't eat, you know someone who does um, and you must read this book. Um, just to start things off, Tom, before we get so serious. Um, speaking of eating, I always love hearing about what cookbooks you are cooking your way through. Um, anything exciting in recent weeks? Well, the one that I've been just completely smitten with for the past couple of months is the one I wrote about on Mother Jones a couple of weeks ago, and that is um, Sammy Tamimi's incredible book, Falistin, or Falistine, I think it's pronounced. And, it, you know, he's just this incredible chef. Uh, he's a British, well, he's in London now. He's a, uh, born in um, East Jerusalem and um, he's been cooking at um, Odalenghi restaurant for years. And so you kind of know the Odalenghi style of really colorful food with like lots of sharp, bright flavors. And he's taking that aesthetic and applying it really to sort of the birthplace of the style of food, um, Palestine. And um, in terms of just, the the cooking in it it's it's just absolutely delightful like these just beautiful highly whipped hummuses that are just feather light with incredible savory vegetables or meat on top of them um completely has changed the way that i think about hummus um so i really really recommend that one i'm sure they have it i don't know if they have a cookbook section at booksmith but um but if they do they should have this um this pay on to pal palestinian cooking that is super fun. And I we just got a thumbs up that in fact, they do have cookbooks there. So <laughs> I'm sure it's there. How about you, Maddie? What are you um, cooking out of? For cooking um, well, I've, I've actually found myself revisiting Jerusalem, which is a cookbook um, Sammy Tamimi worked on with Yotam Odalangi, just because there's so many recipes that do wonders with like late summer eggplants, tomatoes, pepper. Yeah just all of that produce. So it's been a really fun time of year. Um, and actually it, I'm, I'm in Colorado at the moment, it snowed two days ago. So everyone harvested all of their food. So we just have like tons of eggplants on our kitchen counter, so. That's crazy. It was 90 just before it snowed, right? So you went straight yeah. from summer into snow. Yeah, but I'm not complaining about all the produce. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so Tom, um, just to start off, I want to hear what gave you the idea for this book and why you chose the two places, California and the Midwestern Corn Belt. 
Yeah, I mean, the, I, the idea of it really came around 2014, 2015, somewhere in that time frame, when I was doing a lot of coverage of the California drought. You know, you guys had that um, mega drought that started in around 2011, and it was right in the middle of it. And um, I had written some about California before, but I had never really had a chance to get on the ground and report there. And that drought was such a big story. I mean, so this is, you know, obviously this area, you know, supplies a huge amount of the fruits and vegetables that we eat. Um, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a California story, it was a national story. And I, I was doing the food angle on it. And I had been more focused in my career in writing about the Corn Belt and writing about, you know, the sort of um, Midwestern Iowa, you know, former prairie lands of, of that region that are covered in corn and soybeans. So my attention diverts away from that a little bit. I plunge into California and I just start seeing the sort of, you know, what were seeming to me like existential problems there with, you know, basically the farming industry having gotten so big that it had overstripped the water resources that were available to it. And you're getting this sort of drawing down of the aquifer in the Central Valley at this alarming rate, causing all these different problems. So I'm kind of immersed in that story when there is a huge, I mean, I guess let's shift, I guess it was around 2013. So really in, in, that, um, in that process, there is this really wet spring in the Midwest that creates um, all of the soil erosion. And so I got into the soil erosion story there. And as I reported that out, I was getting similar vibes like, you know, this is the other big region that supplies our food. In this case, it's meat. The corn and soybeans goes into feed for the animals. And I'm looking and talking to scientists and I'm seeing this underreported story that soil erosion there is back with a vengeance. I mean, I think a lot of people figured that after the Dust Bowl, some conservation policies were put into place and it was brought under control. And what I was seeing was that it wasn't under control at all. And that, in fact, um, erosion had reached alarming rates. And so I'm thinking, I, I just remember right around the time when this came together, that it was like, look, these are the two regions that, that provide the bulk of the food that we eat, the bulk of the, our material sustenance. And they're both being abused like an old rag by the farming systems that are, um, that are sort of dominating them. And I thought, you know, this is something, you know, combining these two things together is something that would be a really interesting project. And I knew from the start that it would require immersing myself in those regions and that it would also be sort of depressing. Um, and, and that played out, but um, not, you know, not completely. I also had a great time um, being on the ground there and meeting people there in both those places. But so that's sort of how the idea came together is like, look, you know, this is my beat and these are the two key regions of it. And they're both, you know, in a state of ecological unraveling, basically. You do write about workers in this book, um, but it's predominantly focused on environmental issues rather than labor issues, um, though there are definitely some labor issues. Um, but I wondered why, why you decided to really, you know, narrow in on on the the climate angle of it yeah it was a it was a tricky decision and what i decided was you know i'm just you, you think about the history of food politics writing uh, food the, the the beat as we know it really um as far as i can tell started with the uptown sinclair book the jungle and the jungle is the classic book about workers in the food system comes out in 1906 um, it's these, you know, brutal conditions of recent immigrants in the Chicago area stockyards is the topic of it. And he has the famous quote about how he tried to hit, um, you know, he tried to break America's heart, but he hit him in the stomach instead. And I think that has been the challenge of this beat ever since is that it's really hard to get prosperous people who aren't, you know, who make decisions and have power and don't work in the food system to care about food system workers. And it's something that I've tried to make people care about since I've been uh, writing about this stuff. But um, part of the epiphany that I had 
when I, you know, I don't want to, I mean, that's probably, that's way too strong of a word, but part of when that sort of flashbulb uh, moment came that this is a book that I should write. Um, part of the idea that I had was that here is a way to make this tangible for people to, to make these crises, the, these abuses of the food system tangible to people outside of it. Because I can tell you that workers in meatpacking factories are being abused as a matter of course, and you might be really concerned about it, but I think for most people who are, you know, not low income and, you know, have, you know, ha have means, it's something that, that they can forget about really easily and go right um, to um, the fast food restaurant. And, um, you know, there's a famous uh, New Yorker writer who's wonderful, who wrote this peon to the sort of fast food um, chicken sandwich. Uh, that you know what I, that one of the, the big fast food joints uh, sell, and I think that is the the way that most people think about it. Like, oh yeah, this is terrible. Now let me go get my fast food sandwich. And I thought, well, if I focus on the way that the these ecologies are unraveling, and that this bounty that you're so used to, that you become so accustomed to, that seems so stable and so much a fact of life, if I can show how it's not, and in fact that you're, 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 you're eating in a very precarious state because these resources are being depleted, maybe that's the way, that was sort of my experiment, maybe that's the way I get people to, to care about it more and to make it more visceral for people. And when I say people, I mean sort of people outside of those situations. I, I don't wanna assume that my audience is, is anything, but you know, what I was thinking about were you know, the people that bought Omnivore's Dilemma or the people who, who read The New Yorker um, and, and things like that, a way to get them to think about the food system in a way that's more visceral and they're implicated in it. And they're also, um, because they benefit from it, but they're also relying on something that isn't always gonna be there. And I want them to think that through and to think, okay, what can we do that's different? So, you know, one of the ways you did that was to introduce us to people who are really affected on the day to day with some of some of the, um, for instance, drought um, and, you know, other political forces kind of interweaving in California. Um, so you went to spend time with Joe Del Bosque, who's a melon and almond farmer in the San Joaquin Valley near Fresno. Um, and so he farms melons and almonds and because of the challenges with both of those crops, you write that Del Bosque Farms is a microcosm of the threatened San Joaquin Valley and the American agricultural system as a whole. So just starting with melons, basically Joe built his major business on melon farming, but he doesn't think he is going to pass that part of it on to his kids, even though he's selling out in Whole Foods across the country. Um, and that's because it's so labor intensive. So first, I, you know, wanted to hear a little bit about some of the labor issues that he's contending with. Yeah, and I think that these are these the labor issues in California are something that that all of us are going to be impacted by. And so, you know, basically, California agriculture has always relied on low wage labor from Mexico since it's been a, um, a, an American state. That, that has always been the case. It's the sort of resource that it relies on. Uh, the, the border's right there. There were already Mexican nationals living in the area, um, but there's always been a lot of, cro of, of cross border migration. And, um, and, and so, the, and to this day, it's completely dominated by, it, it completely relies on, on labor from Mexico and point south. And um, so what's happening to Del Bosque, what he's, what, what he's thinking about is that there were some labor reforms made in the New Deal, like the eight hour workday, like the 40 hour week, like minimum wage, that were basically as a kind of bargain between FDR and you know, basically, racists and the racist Democrats in the South. Part of the bargain was that a lot of those protections would be denied domestic laborers and farm workers to preserve the sort of power relations in the South, where sharecropping and exploited African American labor was a, was a major source. 
And so things like the minimum wage and the 40 hour work week and time and half overtime didn't apply to, to them. And, um, and so that's been a huge benefit to California. It's been huge the, to California's agriculture system. It's been a, the opposite of a benefit to those workers, obviously. And so California has been moving into, has been sort of moving its farm labor system into the 40s, 1940s. It's been giving them the protections in the New Deal. And so um, it's been raising its minimum wage and applying that to farmers. Uh, there's no national minimum wage for farmers, but it's on a state by state basis. And California has put farmers under the minimum wage. Minimum wage is, is still going up there, I believe. And then something else is being phased in is time and a half overtime. And the way the farm work, farm work works is that when the harvest sits, there's this huge um, labor crunch. You need a lot of labor to get um, the, the harvest in. So there's a lot of overtime that farmers are very happy not to have to pay. And what Del Bosque was saying is that as these laws come into place and he has to pay his workers like any other worker in the United States gets paid, then he is he's going to get priced out of the market. He's doing fancy or fancy, um, pretty labor intensive organic melons to get a nice premium, but he can't get enough of a premium to have his profit and pay his workers. And so he figures that it's probably not going to last very long af after that. And plus, there's this push to um, a very unlabor intensive crop, and that's almonds. So he's looking at all these labor issues with his melons. And then he's looking over at his almond groves where he hires very little labor. It's very mechanized. You need some labor at the harvest, but not very much. You need some pruners sometimes a year. Um, and so he is thinking about really seriously, he figures that his fields as his farm passes on will be converted into almonds. And that opens up his whole second can of worms which is the which is a water problem, and I think that you know. So what he was telling me, and I think what we're going to see in California, is a lot of real hand labor, and I think the crop he mentioned to me was artichokes are already leaving the uh, San Joaquin Valley, going to Mexico and other countries because they're super labor intensive, and um, I think that's another force that is going to push the expansion of uh, of almond and, and pistachio production. Well, it should also make us think too, and we're buying food that comes from Mexico at a lower price, like what the cost of that is, you know? Yeah, it's basically I mean, imposing that, um, those bad labor conditions on more or less the same workers, but south of the border. So onto almonds, um, they require almost no hand labor, but there is a catch. Um, you write about that so well on page 15. So I thought maybe we could have a little reading yes okay um okay so we're talking now about um del bosque and his water situation so i write um to make his farm bloom with so little water from the sky del, Bo del bosque and his san joaquin valley peers rely on water from two sources the first is the annual sn the annual snow melt from the sierra nevada to the east shunted through a network of dams aqueducts and canals that jagged, majestic snow top mountain range is essentially the garden tap for your supermarket's cornucopia. The second source is wells tapped into aquifers beneath, beneath the valley's floor. The two sources are intimately related. Every spring, water gushes down those mountains, accumula accumulating over millennia and filling up those underground water reserves. And when a given year's snow melt is paltry, farmers revert to the pump, drawing down their aquifers. When snow melt is plentiful, they ease up on their wells and the aquifers can at least theoretically recharge. Both sources are in a state of crisis. San Joaquin Valley farmers, including Del Bosque himself, tend to vote Republican and dismiss, dismiss climate change, but they've, but they've observed remarkable changes over the course of their careers. The average amount of snow an annually captured by the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains has declined by as much as 20% between the 1980s and the 2000s. A group of researchers with um, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the analog to the Envi Environmental Protection Agency, projects, projects a further loss of up to 60% by 2050, the result of declining snowfall and rising temperatures, both associated with a warming clim climate. 
Of the years between 2003 and 2015, six qualified as drought years. That is, the Sierra Nevada uh, snowpack came in woefully below the historic norm, leading to cuts in the allotment of water that farmers like Del Bosque received. During the 2011 to 2017 drought, Del Bosque said his water allotment went to zero for three years in a row, forcing him to buy expensive water from farmers in the, in the wetter counties of the Northern Central Valley at prices that essentially wiped out his operation's profits. So he had to buy water because he didn't have enough flowing by from, or enough in his aquifers? Yeah, he's in a rough spot because he's got pretty good water rights that don't mean a thing if, if, a, if, the snow pack, if the snow pack doesn't arrive, but he's got really bad water beneath him that's pretty mm -hmm. salty and pretty deep down and hard to get to, and it's not really economical for him to use it. So he is someone who um, doesn't even have access to the aquifer. That's, that's, been, that's been tapped away. And so when that happens, you know, what he does is he uh, basically fallows a lot of his melons. He's like, these aren't even worth planting. I'm not, not even going to plant them and buys enough water to keep his almonds going. He's, you know, you got to keep, if you, if you stop, if you stop uh, watering your almonds, then your plantation dies and you lose a multi-million dollar investment. So you're definitely focused on those almonds. And so he cuts way back on his, uh, his melons and focuses his water on his almonds and just goes into survival mode. And so that's kind of where he is. I mean, the way that water rights work in, in a lot of the West, I mean, it kind of traces back to racist ideas during the gold rush, right? So like yeah, the first settlers to divert a stream and put it to quote unquote beneficial use, like for gold extraction, establish the right to continue to to draw from that quantity forever. Um, yeah, and that, and that right still exists on that land. You know, it, it's, it's pretty crazy. And you point out like indigenous people were excluded and I imagine other people were excluded from that at the time. But, um, you know, I, I think that probably carries through to, to the makeup of people who have access to water today. And I was wondering, you know, why do you think legislators have held on to this policy for so long? Um, and like, why has it set us up for this mountain, mountain crisis? Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a kind of a, a typical problem in our in our system, not just our food system, but our economic system. And that is that, you, you know, you when you get that water right, it's incredibly valuable. Just imagine how valuable that is. And imagine the difference in value between land that has a high, a good water right and land that has a junior water right. And, and that gets sort of capitalized and, and put into the price of the land and um and so you get these really powerful interests that um you know this cuts across party lines in california that aren't willing to change things um it, you know it's like the sort of this you know in the american context this ancient um system and uh, you know the other crazy thing that existed until really recently was for groundwater when you own land, you own the water under it, uh, which is kind of a stupid idea. Uh, but you could you could plant you could um, plunge a well into the into the ground and take as much water as you wanted. There was even a beneficial use um, kind of uh, situation. It was just you know if you if you own the land, you could you could do that. And um, it took into 20, 2014 through many droughts and many controversies between neighbors because of course. Maddie, if you and you and I are neighbors, and I plunge a uh, a really deep uh, well and suck all the water out, and your well goes dry, then um, it's not a very neighborly thing. And you, your response is either going to be to have to drop to drop an even bigger well in, and we get into a little water war. And those kinds of conflicts had gotten so crazy during the 2011 to 2017 drought that in 2014 that the, the legislature just broke and actually made it made up probably too weak, but they actually regulated groundwater by saying that all of these basins have to come into balance by 2040, which is pretty interesting because what it means is you can't extract more than goes back in. 
And so that resource is going to have to be used a lot differently than it is now. And it's going to lead to really serious changes in the, in the San Joaquin Valley for sure. Because as you were just reading, there's not a lot coming in if we're following the climate models. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Um, so moving on over to the Corn Belt, although we can we can come back to Cal California and there, there'll be a chance for anyone watching to ask questions. Um, so you went to Iowa during stormy weather um, and you drove around with this soil scientist named Rick Cruz, who has been monitoring erosion in the soil in that area. And I don't think you, one thinks about reading a food book and learning so much about things like ephemeral gullies, but I just want to know why that's so important for our understanding of kind of the predicament the Corn Belt is in. Yeah, so Rick Cruz is a super fascinating fellow. He's a professor at Iowa State University, and um, you know, what he taught me was that if you talk to a sort of conventional USDA person who's involved in, you know, soil conservation in the USDA, they will tell you that, hey, you know, there's erosion problems in Iowa and Corn Belt, but it's not that bad because we're um, losing about five tons per acre of topsoil per year. And that sounds really bad, but the natural replenishment rate is also about five tons. And maybe we're losing more like five point, well, I think the latest number is 5.8 from the USDA. So that's starting to get a little bit out of balance, but it's not like an immediate problem. You know, in a world on fire right now, it's, you know, it doesn't seem like the biggest problem that, you know, we're losing 5.8 tons and getting back five. We can kind of stay in a steady state for a while. But Rick, Richard Cruz says there's two big problems with that. One is that there's a kind of erosion that is not being counted in that estimate. And that erosion, that erosion is called gully erosion. And what that means is that, you know, basically throughout the Corn Belt, corn and soybean fields, which dominate the region, are left bare uh, between the, the harvest in November-ish and the establishment of the next crop in, let's say, middle or late May. For the months in between, the grounds are essentially left bare um, because there's a, such a hyper-focus on corn and soybeans. And so what happens when these winter, late winter and early spring storms come, they just pummel bare dirt, uh, bare ground, and it just puts soil on the move at this incredible rate. And one thing that happens is the, the land is not, contrary to popular belief, it's not 100% flat in, in the Corn Belt. It's, there's actually contours and sloping hill, you know, gently sloping hills. And when these really strong storms hit, the, these gullies, these natural gullies form along the path of water and they take incredible amounts of soil away, but the USDA doesn't count them in their estimates. And so what Richard Cruz has been doing, he's been observing this forever and he's trying to figure out, it's really hard to count it. You can count, it's because it's so inconsistent. The topography is so complicated um, and he's developing ways to count it, but what he figures from years and years of experience and looking at it, is that on average, it's really, really bad some years. 2019 was a horrible year. There was, you know, massive amounts of erosion. You know, there were places that were losing 20 tons, uh, entire counties losing 20 tons per acre in the span of weeks, uh, not over the year, but in the span of weeks. And, um, but then, then you have years that aren't so bad. Um, but what he figures is that ephemeral gully erosion, and so he, he takes me around and I describe it in the book, and you just see these gashes of, of gashes, uh, uh, empty gashes in the dirt, and it's just vanished soil that's been washed away. Um, and what he figures is that there's about three tons of soil on average taken away this way. So now you're at eight tons of erosion and five tons of replenishment. But he says that the science of replenishment is really dodgy and it's really contested. And he says the best science is it really replenishes at about a half ton per year. So now you've got eight being lost and a half ton being replenished. So the ratio now becomes 16 to one. And I think that does end up rising to the top of our problems because 
the Corn Belt is such a key node in our food system. And it is really this glorious resource. It's like one of the three, or I think four or five um, places in the world that have this black prairie derived topsoil. And humanity needs to take care of these places. And they're all going under US style industrial agriculture. And so, yeah, it's a bad situation. And so that's the, that's the importance of Goli erosion. And so, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons that's happening, which you just said, but just to recap, the, the ground is being left bare in the winter because corn and soybeans are the main crops. And so it makes it easier for, you know, when big storms come for more of that soil to wash away. But one of the solutions to that is planting something over the winter that like holds on to that soil. And yeah. those, um, those are called cover crops. And so one of the glimmers of hope in this passage, in the, in the section of the book, is um, this, this guy named Tom Franzen. And so I wondered if you could just read on page 149. Yeah. You know, he, know <laughs> the horrors of, of the erosion. Yeah, so Tom was a, a, a breath of fresh air um, in, in my trip and in this book. So I'll, I'll start reading now. Um, I pulled into a driveway off a dirt road to find Francis modest farmhouse opposite several barns under the waning dusk light. The air smelled alive, sweet, slightly pungent. The scent of livestock kept at a scale that matched the surrounding land landscape's ability to handle their waste. Unlike most farms in the 21st century Corn Belt, which specializes in, crop, in crops or livestock, Franson's farm includes hogs and cattle along with 300 acres of field crops, grown mostly for feed. He markets the feed he produces through Organic Valley, a farmer-owned cooperative known mostly for dairy, but which also sells organic pork and beef. Weary from a long day of driving, reporting, and immersion in the spectacle of ecological destruction, I hoped you would keep our interview short and invite me back in the morning. As I stepped out, as I stepped out of the car, I heard the growl of a well-worn three-wheel ATV. Mustached, 60 something, balding, and dressed in a rumpled button down blue, blue work shirt, Branson was beckoning me to jump on, to jump aboard. Before I knew it, I was perched on the vehicle's side, white knuckling the sidebar with one hand and holding a voice recorder in the other as we, as we roared through the muddy barnyard. We lurched onto a trail behind, um, beaten into a, uh, into a pasture. Above the motor's hum, Branson was saying something about rye. We moved over a slight rise in the land, and on the other side, I saw it. A field of rich green stretching to, to, the, to a line of 300, of, um, I'm sorry, a, a field of rich green stretching to a line of trees hundreds of yards back. We stopped at the field's edge, and Franson jumped off the ATV, ATV, grabbed something from the back, and headed into the rye, which swayed lightly in the gentle wind, its thickly planted stalks reaching his chest. Surrounding by, surrounded by his rye, he produced a sign naming the variety he had planted, Brasetto, and the small seed company that distributes it, Albert Leah Seeds. Franson was ready for his photo op and I complied, snapping a shot in the low light at the, as the sunset gathered, uh, gathered behind them. Suddenly I felt energized. In a landscape of beaten up fields and, um, and sad corn crops, here is a lush, tall blanket of vegetation. And Franson, despite a frantic day in the field, was excited to make his pitch that adding rye to the corn soybean rotation is a powerful antidote to the ravages of squandered soil and fouled water that's eating away at the corn belt. Such a spirited rye farmer. Yes. <laughs> um, so I just kind of want to broaden it out now that we've heard a little bit about um, how the resources that go into making most of our food in the country are really in threat of, you know, water especially and drought in California and um, erratic weather and erosion in the Corn Belt. Um, but it strikes me that, you know, a lot of the food you describe is being exported. So almonds are this fast growing and nuts in general is fast growing um, industry. Uh, in California, and I don't remember the statistic, but we export a lot of them to Asia. And then in, over in the Corn Belt, um, a lot of the corn and soybeans are going into 
pork that we're also sending to China. And so it just kind of made me wonder, like, should we, is, should, is part of the message of your book that we need to stop exporting food elsewhere or, or just think more locally or, or how did, because, you, you know, I, I don't want to sound like anti-globalist because we import a yeah. lot of food, but I just kind of was thinking through that, like, what did, what did you take away? Yeah, so I have I have thought a lot about that, and I think I don't think there's anything wrong with the trade of with the trade of food, and I think that like you know basically California is uniquely positioned. It's a great place to grow almonds. Almonds have to be grown in a Mediterranean climate with you know long dry summers and mild winters. It's the only way that they, that you can grow them. And when you grow them on, I mean, I, I, I'm against, you know, big plantations, vast monocrops, but, um, you know, if you're going to do that, you need a lot of water to do that. And California does have this incredible, if dwindling resource in the Sierra Nevada. And so California should be producing more almonds than we Americans eat, can eat. And it should be sending some of them overseas. I think that um, oh, I think we're overdoing it in, in terms of almonds. I think we've, um, because the, the, the problem is that um, it, it hardens demand. That means that like you, you, you basically can't follow it in, in bad years. And so you're just putting this relentless pressure essentially on the aquifer. Um, and so I, I think that that's the situation there. The Corn Belt is a little bit different in that you know, there's this rhetoric that you hear more in, in the Midwest than you hear it in, the, um, in California, but you, you hear it in California too, you know, we're feeding the world. And that's why, you know, we may foul the water, we may destroy the soil, but we're, you know, this is necessary because we've got to feed the world. And if you actually look at it, um, you know, I think that, in, you know, and you, you, you'll also hear about, you know, you know, people in places like Africa or South Asia, Southeast Asia, who don't have enough to eat. And if you, when you look at the statistics, you know, basically what we're feeding is not anyone who's low income. What we're feeding is with the corn and soybean crop and the, um, and the, the pork that we export and the tremendous amount of chicken that we export too. We're feeding uh, consumers in the rising middle class throughout the world or middle class Europeans or the, the rising middle class of, of China, but we're not saving anyone from starvation. Like there are many other things, there are many healthy diets that can be had that aren't based on feedlot meat. And so um, I, I don't think the way that it's being used now is some kind of huge asset for global agriculture that, um, or some kind of like important um, lifeline for, for poor people in the global south. And in fact, one thing that you are seeing is with something like corn in a country that has based its, its diet on corn, like Mexico, what we're seeing, you know, and this goes back millennia in Mexico, and you can actually have a really healthy diet, like the, pre, the pre-industrial diet in Mexico is actually fine. Um, you know, people were really healthy on it. Um, and all of the diet related diseases in Mexico are coming from people switching over to a more American style diet. But what we're doing with corn exports in Mexico is basically driving the price down and uh, driving a huge agrarian crisis. Like Mexico has decided, um, it, it's been ambivalent, I think, in the past 30 or 40 years about whether it wants to maintain an agrarian society, whether it wants to have a, a robust countryside. And I think that's sort of baked into the Mexican Revolution, but in the neoliberal age, starting with Salinas, they moved away from it. Um, and so what you're seeing is, you've seen this huge influx of American corn, this destruction of livelihoods in the countryside, and a huge influx of people who can't be absorbed into jobs in Mexico City or Puebla or the North. And this migration, which has slowed in recent years, but there was a huge migration North in the 90s and parts of the 2000s that are th that then feeds this backlash with our awful ra racist nativists uh, against my, uh, immigration. But a huge part of that was this policy of way over producing corn and sending it to Mexico at below the cost of production. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, it's doing the exact opposite of feeding the world. It's creating hunger 
and 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 poverty. And so, um, so well, I I think that you know I, I think it makes sense to you know when you you have a great region like California or the Midwest to produce more than than can be consumed there and to export the the excess. But I think the way that we're doing it, there's really no case for it. And you know, with the almonds, like um, the almonds going to Asia, that's another middle class and up um, product. And if you look at the marketing that they've done, the California Almond Board or the Basaccio Board, they're really pushing a culture of snacking on China. That they're, they're sort of like helping create a culture of snacking on China that wasn't really there. It's like, hey, eat these beautiful nuts. And, um, and, you know, between your meals, there's not a big uh, between meals eating culture there. And uh, it's pretty funny the way they use sort of the California sunshine as a, as a marketing tool in their, in their materials. But, you know, once again, you know, that almond trade is not, it's not feeding, the, you know, it's not feeding hungry people. It isn't um, contrary to what, you know, some folks say, it's not really substituting for meat. It isn't like, people are eating almonds instead of meat in a place like China, there is an additive snack for, you know, fairly well off people. Um, I have a audience question that relates to what we were just talking about previously. And so if people have more questions, they can start to put them in the comments. Um, and I have a few more too. But Pascal Simone Schmidt wonders why are we not doing more cover crops, which is a great question. <laughs> yeah, because I so, you say like only three percent of acres yeah. in Iowa are covered with cover crops. Right. I think it's um, it's basically a pain. They're a, they're a pain to manage. I mean, if your system is you know you harvest your crop in the fall and plant in the spring. A cover, you know, that's a nice schedule and, you know, you can take a vacation in the winter time and cover crops require more management. Um, and they're also, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily appropriate for every part of the Midwest because um, at least on the corn soy rotation, because you got to get them established before winter hits. You have to get them really kind of up and, and going before winter hits. And if you're in the northern part of the Corn Belt, like northern Iowa, like Tom Franson says he can't do cover crops, this rye farmer. And that's why, so rye for him is a cash crop. It's, you know, he's kind of uh, tweaked his rotation and he's added rye and he plants it in the fall and it overwinters and he harvests it in the middle of the summer. Um, and that gives him plenty of time to establish a cover crop in that rye field. But for the most part, um, when he's growing corn and soybeans, he can't really do um, cover crops. And so that's why he's shifting into rye. And I think that um, while I am probably partially responsible, I'm one of the voices calling, you know, making sort of cover crops the center of the conversation, I think that it should be more about diversification in general, like figuring out other ways, you know, the, the goal is just to keep the, the ground covered over the winter. So th there are more ways to do that than cover crops. And one thing that I've gotten really interested in that I've only learned since the book has been finished is actually appropriate for the Midwest. And that is um, tree plantations, not giant, you know, almond uh, monocultures, but planting strips of tree of um, nut trees in fields. And, you know, trees can be an incredible way to, you could, you could grow lines of nut trees in places known to caught where ephemeral valley, uh, ephemeral gullies happened. And they would, um, you know, survive these little floods that go through, and they would keep the um, the, the soil in the ground. They, they're, uh, you, you, you can't do better than trees for preventing erosion. So I think um, um, silvo silvo pasture. You, you can work animals into that system really well. I think perennial um, grasses and uh, getting animals back onto the land and doing more um, grass finished beef and uh, pastured hog production in the Midwest, where you have perennial pastures would also be a great addition to it. Um, but I mean, it all comes back, and to get back to, to Paul, Pascal's original question, it all comes back to incentives. Like if there is no penalty for surrendering all this soil, I mean, the penalty is that your yields are gonna drop over time, but if you're looking really sh you know, short term, and if you're a renter in the Midwest, more and more land in, uh, in the Midwest 
is being rented, you don't necessarily care about the long-term fate of that land. And so there's no incentive to worry about keeping it covered. And so tweaking farm policy to create incentives for keeping it covered and penalties, I think, for basically polluting. I mean, agriculture is exempted from the Clean Water Act. So when you, know, when you have one of these erosion events, it's not just your soil that's leaving, it's all the chemicals that you put into that soil. And that is fouling water all throughout the Midwest. And I think you know, regulating these practices is also gonna have to come into play. It can't just be incentives. I mean, there's a lot more we didn't get into that you that you go in depth on in this book. Um, you kind of lay out this system that's fueled by big agribusinesses, forcing farmers to mass produce, basically forcing farmers to, <laughs> to be dependent on a system where they're mass producing commodities or cheap meat or water sucking crops like almonds. But it's it's kind of a new normal. And so we've become pretty dependent or complacent about this food system. Um, so what's it going to take for people to reject it in mass? And, and have you seen any inklings of potential for this in any of the areas you reported on? Yeah. So everywhere you go, you find cool, you know, you find cool farmers who are doing things differently. And, um, and I think th that is a, a big asset. That's something that we can build on that there are people in the Midwest who are doing fantastic agriculture with, yeah, I mean, the, the thing about it is, these areas are gifted with these great um, assets. Um, and so you find people using them in really smart ways and preserving them. And I think that the trick is gonna have to be that we're really, as a society, gonna have to change policy. I mean, we've been, you know, I wrote this piece on David Brandt in 2013 and Mother Jones, revisited him in the book. And um, he's been this very successful farmer in his corner of, uh, Ohio for, for years and years and years. He's a visionary farmer, but he has made some individual choices that are fantastic. He has done his best to sort of proselytize. Uh, he's like the king of cover crops. He does cover, he's a little bit south. Cover crops are, are great for him and he does them great, but his proselytizing is nothing against crop insurance subsidies, um, commodity payments, um, having a president who is, uh, you know, currently right now, to a degree I have not seen in my career covering this, literally parachuting cash into farm country in an effort, you know, he's, there's very excuses for these extra payments the farmers are getting, but what it's really doing is just sort of holding this ridiculous system in place. And so I think, you know, the thing we have to do is change policy. I mean, I think in California, um, better water management um, has to happen outside of California, more incentives to bulk up uh, fruit and vegetable production to take pressure off of California. And then in the Midwest, I think just changing the system and redirecting some of these subsidies to paying people to do things that instead of, hey, you know, produce as much corn as you can or soybeans as you can, you know, hold as much soil in place as you can. And when you do that, all kinds of studies show the yields will take care of themselves. Like if we pay farmers, to hold soil in place, yields are not gonna drop, we're not gonna starve. And in fact, it's gonna keep that land um, able to be in production for a lot longer than what we're doing right now. And so, you know, it comes down to a, a, political, um, a, a political problem, not a technological problem. So you're saying we need to vote? <laughs> yeah, uh, we gotta vote, for well, sure. How did, how did this, writing this book change the way you eat? Did it really change the way I eat? I mean, the thing is, I'm such a food nerd and I, I kind of got into this whole topic by, you know, being, you know, actually in Austin, Texas in the mid nineties is when I sort of put my first garden in. And this is actually before we had uh, proper farmer's markets in Austin, but I remember, you know, skulking around trying to find the best fruits and vegetables. And then moving to New York in 1998, when really this sort of local food movement was just starting to take off and experiencing the farmer's markets, the Grand Emory Plaza farmer's market, the Union Square farmer's market. So, you know, those were really formative um, experiences. And so I've kind of 
been, and then, you know, I've moved to a farm. And so I've really, you know, personally focused on eating in season um, and, you know, not eating this industrial food. But I think that my, my own personal choices don't end up being that interesting. I, you know, I'm kind of a freak. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I can say, you know, you should eat just like me, but no one's going to want to listen to that. I think these are systemic problems. And I think that, you know, if anything, the, the writing the book um, pushed me more onto that path and maybe more obsessed with avoiding the, um, the, the fruits of these giant factory farms. But... What what would you t tell people who, you know, are trying to eat locally, um, but live in climates that don't have year round agriculture, like they don't live in California, basically. Yeah. Because most of those places, you know, I mean, you know, Colorado or the Midwest or anywhere really are eating California's food for the rest of the year. Right. Yeah. That that's a that's a really hard one. I think that um, I mean the thing that I do when I'm living in a really northern climate in in the winter is uh, I I kind of focus on like I just I never can get excited about salad greens shipped across the country. They're, by the time they get to us, they're not very fun. Um, and and so, but I'm also crave green things, and so I'll focus on stuff like herbs somehow parsley makes it over in California in better shape than than lettuce does and I think it's got probably more to it and so I'll start making um, parsley salads a lot in the winter eating a lot of parsley but I think that this is a problem that we can actually solve if we think about it and that is that there's been so much cool season extension technology that can be um, really green like stuff like um, passive solar greenhouses or even it doesn't even have to be passive solar you can even have a heated greenhouse that is um, oriented in a cold place to catch to maximize sun um, and heat it a little bit and do incredible amounts of food production there's actually a really famous justifiably famous farmer up in Maine named Elliot Coleman he's way up in Maine and he has perfected this technique of, he calls it four season farming, but his, his most famous for his winter, like February salad greens and carrots in Maine. And you know, what he told me one time is that basically every time you put a cover over your, um, your plants, you know, your crop in the winter, you're going a thousand miles south. And this is, this is totally passive. This is just like, a plastic cover that the sun can get through. So he's up in Maine, he puts one of them on and he's in the mid-Atlantic. And then he puts another one on, so you got a double cover and now you're down in the Southeast. And so he's able to do these really high quality vegetables in this really simple way. And I think that we could, um, you know, make investments and incentivize that kind of production in places like, and it, you know, it actually is happening. This has been a, a topic in Sustainable Act for a while in places like Minnesota and, you know, in the Northeast. And, you know, we had Maverick Farms in uh, North Carolina, which is up in the mountains. It's at about 3,000 feet. So it's got a pretty um, forced, you know, a pretty cold winter up there, actually. When I moved there from New York, I didn't really notice much of a, more of a, a mild winter. And we actually built with a grant to pass a solar greenhouse that had these big water tanks that were up against a sort of hillside berm and we stacked these these black water tanks and it was oriented to catch the to maximize uh, solar capture so the sun comes in it hits the um these water tanks and heats up all day and it releases at night and we were able to do a lot of you know grow a good amount of food year round and um those kinds of tech i mean the thing is like the, the kind of stuff i'm talking about isn't necessarily untechnological we can still use our brains and think of things to do this isn't necessarily technology from a bag or um you know a bag of seeds or um, you know a, a carton of, uh, of pesticides it's um it's sort of using our minds to figure out what are the gaps that we need to to fix and investing in them and i think greenhouse technologies are are fantastic um so Kelly Nishimura, 
asks, what can we do if we have the perfect weather and conditions to grow food locally year round, but our government and courts are pro-development? We don't have good candidates to vote for in Hawaii. Everyone's in the pocket of developers. Yes, that is a major problem. You know, one of the paradoxes of farming that I, I found when, when I was doing it was the places where you get a good price for your produce the places where you can, you know, maybe scratch out a living farming are close to urban areas. Like, you know, if you're a farmer in striking distance of San Francisco or New York City, you're, you're in the Hudson Valley or, you know, Austin, Texas, then you um, you have a shot to be a farmer, you know, to, to, to make a good living because there's people with money that want to buy these goods. But those same forces create a, a real a hot real estate market and so if you're a young person who wants to farm in the bay area you're there are great land trusts like the marin county land trust but you're competing with um some guy who works at google who wants to have a second home and he's going to outbid you for that land and if he doesn't outbid you he's going to drive up the price up so high that your note on that land is never going to make any money there's never going you're never going to make enough money to pay that note and I think a place like Hawaii with its tourism industry and people retiring there is really similar. There's a lot of money and there's people who want to buy the food, but real estate has got to be super expensive. And I think this is really a key, such a key issue. And um, it may be a part of the topic of, uh, of another book project if I'm lucky enough to, to write another one. But I think that, you know, similarly, the problem that Kelly is talking about is a policy problem. Like, do we want to have, do we as a society want to have farms in, in Hawaii? Or do we want to have Hawaii be a massive, even though it's got great growing conditions for a lot of things, do we want it to be a massive food importer and just sort of live off of, of imports? Well, if it's a society we want there to be food grown there, then we need to figure out policies that encourage that. And I think stuff like land trusts um, are gonna be really important. And they can't just be rich people saying, okay, I'm gonna put an easement on this land so it can be farmed. That's great, it's happening, it should happen more, but there's not enough of them to make a, uh, you know, to solve the problem. And so I think there's gonna have to be a public effort to figure that out. A publicly owned land trust that maybe buys land from people and reserves it for farming. And, and things like that. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't have any easy answers to that question. I, I think it's, um, it's super, super difficult. Um, Lad Bethune asks, um, are you aware of the Bionutrient Food Association and the Real Food Campaign? I think, and um, maybe um, Lad can, can type a little bit more into the chat, but I think what it's referring to is the sort of drop in nutrients over time in conventional foods of all kinds and the way that um, foods are becoming less nutrient dense. Maddie, you'll remember I wrote a piece yeah. about that. There's various reasons for it. Um, one is all the extra um, carbon in the air is creating plants that are diluted. Um, another one is um, stuff is being bred to be hauled over long distances and to have various industrially friendly attributes like uniformity and things like that instead of for nutrition. And um, maybe, maybe Lad can let me know if I'm on the right track here. But mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is that. Tweet at us you know, later. <laughs> what's that? I said, or he can tweet at us later. Yeah, you can tweet it us later, but the answer to that problem, if, if it's one, one you're talking about, is, is just to, um, you know, demand higher, you know, higher quality food and, and come up with a strategy for make, you know, I think plant breeding is going to be a big part of it. I think, um, you know, adding a lot of stuff like compost to soil is going to be a big part of it and making that something that farmers get paid for. I mean, farmers get paid a premium for organic and, and also for, you know, for, for something that's really local, but they don't necessarily get paid a premium at the wholesale level because this orange has more vitamin C than that orange. And I think, 
you know, figuring out a, a way to make that happen is, is, is going to be the answer. Um, well, I, if anyone else has a question, ask now. I wanted to kind of end um, by asking, because we are careening towards the election, um, what you were thinking, what you've observed about Biden's agriculture policy and what kinds of things he's cooking up um, in case he ends up being our next president. Yeah, I believe, I feel like there's some mixed signals going on. I think, you know, one of the things is that is undeniable is that Kamala Harris has actually done, has, as a legislator, has proposed some things that I think would address at least some of the problems, especially with, with regard to workers. She has she's pushed a bill to basically take the California labor regime where farmers get paid or farm workers get paid time, time and a half and take that national. She's, I think, co-signed the Cory Booker bill around. She's co-sponsored the one where he wants to phase out um, uh, large industrial animal operations, which I think is a great idea. Um, and generally shown a tendency to, to new thinking on ag that um, this is a sort of new generation that's coming out with these new ideas that we haven't seen in a while that are, you know, absolutely radical compared to what a senator was, was, you know, rolling out 20 years ago. Like those kinds of bills are absolutely unheard of. Of course, they're going nowhere, but they're putting a marker in the ground and signaling that. So I think that, that that's really positive that she has that. Biden is definitely from the Vilsack school. He's a buddy with Vilsack, who was in the administration with Vilsack. Vilsack was Obama's USDA director. Uh, Tom Vilsack, he was the um, mayor, of the sort of the, the governor of, of Iowa. And he has got a very conventional view of agriculture policy. And, you know, he has come out against antitrust, breaking up these big um, oligopolies. And I think he's had a, a big impact on some of the policy that's coming out of um, Biden's shop. Uh, some of us were um, rather taken aback during the DNC when they, um, they held, during the uh, national convention, when they held a, um, they held this sort of reception for about agriculture, and it's supposed to be where the DNC kind of brought forth its um, its ideas on food policy, and it was shockingly shot through with exactly with the sort of lobbyists from the big chemical companies, and um, and I thought that just signaled like, oh God, here we you know we're we're stepping back and we're 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 just sort of doing the same thing again, but um, but you know I think you know here's my here's my overall idea of the case here with, with Biden, that he is this very conventional thinker, very mired in the sort of politics of, of the past, which in ag is the policies that have gotten us right where we are that I write about in my book. That's not a Republican thing. I, I wish I could say it was, but that's, these policies come up from a bipartisan consensus. There's no, no doubt about that. And he's, he's locked into that old consensus but he's coming in in such a weird time after, you know, if he comes in, it's after four years of Trump, which just sort of shatters every norm of American politics um, through this unprecedented and insane pandemic that we're in. This is grinding on this economic crisis that, um, you know, could, could lurch into being um, on the level of the Great Depression. And I think it will if there's not a lot of government intervention in stopping it. And obviously that's not happening before November. It's not happening before January 20th. Uh, the, the lame duck is, is gonna be crazy if, um, if, if Biden wins. And, um, and so he's coming in with this incredible amount of flux. And um, I've been reading this great book um, about John Maynard Keynes and his sort of biography. And it's reminding me that uh, he's an economist from um, in the, mid the middle of last century in, in Great Britain. Um, first half of the last century. And um, it's reminding me that FDR, when he came in, was a rather conventional politician. He was sort of governor mm -hmm. of New York, old money, kind of mired in the politics of his day. 
very much about the gold standard and you know we, we can't have deficits deficits are terrible and he steps in and there's this economic freefall that had been going on for a couple of years you know misery hunger starvation um farms going belly up um this paradox of food being so cheap the, the farms can't stay in business but people still starving and um based on this crisis and based on the social movements and really the labor movement went into revolt. So, you know, Roosevelt was this conventional politician who authored the New Deal, which is the most radical break in US politics since the Civil War. And I think that there's that kind of potential there with Biden. As much as he might want to turn the clock back to 2016, he's not gonna have that option. And, um, and you know, there's this, uh, to go the other way, there's this right-wing economist, um, Milton Friedman, who has a famous um, quote about how in a, cr in a bad crisis, policymakers, they grope for ideas that are lying around when they're trying to solve these problems. And so his idea was, let's create a lot of sort of, you know, right-wing policy papers. So when um, the next crisis hits, that's what will be lying around. And I think that you know, in the past few years with the climate movement, with farmers like Thomas Franson, who I discuss in this book, um, with the local food movement, we've generated some ideas that will be lying around. And I think that there is potential for things to come together for, for you know, there to be a transformative agricultural policy um, going forward. Something that, you know, I've never seen potential for in my career, I've seen farm bills that are just stuck in the stagnation of the same old politics, Democratic and Republican. And I think we, you know, there's a chance that, that we can break through that. And, and that's what I take a lot of hope in right now. That's great. I, I think that's, that's a more hopeful note to end on. So thank you. Um, thank you so much to Booksmith. This has been great to work with you and, and, Thank you to everyone who's tuned in and congrats again to Tom. I'm Thank sure they so can much. pick up their book, the, a book at Booksmith. Yes, uh, you can buy it online from Booksmith. And Absolutely. I just want to say how much I appreciate Booksmith and I really wish, you know, uh, I, I really wish I could be there. Um, yeah. Even even right now, I, I mean, I, you know, you guys are really suffering out there right now. You guys are at the, the sort of, bleeding edge of the climate crisis and it's horrible and i think everyone every everyone who lives here should should see that and see what it means to live in a ecology that's being destroyed by climate change and um and so thank you so much for pushing through with this evan and uh for all that you do for running a great bookstore in the hate for you know you know the, the people behind booksmith um, it's it's just amazing. I, I'm I'm really touched to be able to participate in this um, in this conversation with you. Oh, thank you, Tom. That's that's very kind of you. It, uh, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation, and, and you know it's a it's a pleasure to host you. Certainly, um, congratulations again on the book, um, and uh, and thanks for being here tonight, Maddie. Thank you so much for for uh, for joining us and for for leading the conversation. Thank um, you. Um, Truly, uh, my pleasure. Um, and, and everyone um, who's, who's tuned in, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, uh, as Tom mentioned, you can get the book uh, from Booksmith. I'll drop the link in the uh, comments one more time. Um, take care and stay well um, out there, everyone. Hopefully we can meet in person um, in the nearest future. But until then, um, see, you, see you on Zoom, see you on Facebook. Um, take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, everyone.